it's five minutes. So our last speaker today is Robert Koenig. Um, he was already sort of announced in uh, Sergey's talk. Um, okay, go ahead, uh, Robert. Okay, um, so first um, I'd like to thank the organizers for making this happen and also for allowing me to speak here. So this is joined for Sergei Bravi, Alexander Klisch, and Eugene Tang. And um, uh, there's quite a bit of overlap with what Sergei already said, but in this talk, I will focus on uh, limitations. So this is sort of a negative results instead of constructive positive results. Um, okay, so let me start at the beginning. So of course, um, we are typically interested in physics in finding ground state energies. And this is difficult because we have to vary over an exponentially large Hilbert space. So the standard approach is uh, usually to some restricted set of states um, that can be efficiently represented. And, um, and then we just minimize over this subset of states. So there are two natural questions that we should ask here. The first one is whether um, we can actually approach this ground state energy and um, the second one is perhaps whether we can do this efficiently. I will focus on the first question in this talk. So, um, so in this talk, I will um, restrict um, attention to cl classical diagonal Hamiltonians and uh, variational families of states uh, specified by quantum circuits, including in particular the uh, QAOA circuits. Okay, so, uh, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to uh, maximize a function on the Boolean hypercube. And uh, the example that we're focusing on is max cut problem. Um, this on some graph, this takes this form if you introduce binary variables uh, for every vertex. Now, um, as you will know, computing the maximum is MP hard. So instead, uh, what we are aiming for is basically an approximation algorithm. And we measure its quality in terms of the approximation ratio, which is sort of the expected value of this cost function compared to the maximum. Now, um, the uh, most famous and, and, and really beautiful algorithm uh, that, that's known for this purpose is the Gerwitz Williamson uh, algorithm, which is based on randomized grounding of an SCP relaxation. And it achieves this uh, approximation ratio of 0.878 for every graph G. So this is sort of uh, in, the, in the worst case. And this is really remarkable because um, there's good evidence to believe that in fact, this is optimal among efficient, that is polynomial time algorithm, uh, algorithms. So if you assume the unique games conjecture, then um, there cannot be any better algorithm in, in the worst case. So, so, so in the classical case, we have something very um, precise to compare to, and, and, and this is sort of um, the number we would like to um, compete with in the quantum case. Okay, so, um, so, so in the quantum case, we can use um, this QAOA algorithm by Farhi, Golson, and Gottman. And as Sergey already explained, um, basically you start by preparing a certain state, and then you measure in the computational basis to get a bit string. So of course, um, I have to specify what these states are, and they are defined in terms of these two Hamiltonians. So one is a problem Hamiltonian, which encodes this cost function, and the other one is this transverse field um, Hamiltonian. And now we just alternate uh, evolution um, between these two Hamiltonians, starting with the O plus state. So a level P QAOA state is defined in terms of two P variational parameters, uh, beta and gamma, and it, it takes this form here. Um, now I should probably remark that of course, um, B is a sum of single qubit terms. So you get a single qubit unitaries when you exponentiate. And for cost functions um, such as max cut on a bounded degree graph, um, C is also going to be a sum of local terms. And this means that you actually get a nice quantum circuit also for this Hamiltonian part. Now, what is important for the following is, is this level P. So I should say a few things about uh, the choice. Uh, obviously we would like to choose a large uh, level P to have 
a large descriptive power and to get close to this maximum energy. But at the same time, increasing p means that we have to um, we have more variational parameters, and this makes energy maximization harder. And um, and perhaps the most important reason to consider small p is the fact that um, large p requires uh, deep circuits, and uh, for for NISQ circuits, we would like to consider um, constant p, or at least some small values of p. Okay, so so this is um, basically the question we would like to address here. Can we beat um, this German's Williams algorithm for max cut using constant level QAOA? And the basic theme of this talk is uh, lower bounds on uh, circuits preparing certain states, and in particular, symmetric unitary circuits. So let me define symmetry. Um, the symmetry that we are interested in is Z2 symmetry. So we have the symmetry operator, which is Pauli X on every qubit. And we say that the Hamiltonian is Z2 symmetric if it commutes with this symmetry operator. Here are two examples. Now, um, we can also define a state to be Z2 symmetric if it's an eigenstate of this symmetry operator. An example is the GHC state given here, or this product state of all plus. And finally, we will call a unitary Z2 symmetric if it commutes with the symmetry operator. Now, why is this concept relevant? Well, um, it turns out that the QAOA circuit is actually Z2 symmetric, and um, the initial state is also Z2 symmetric. So this is the case whenever the cost function has the property that um, it is invariant under flipping all the bits. And this is the case for max cut, for example. So then this Hamiltonian will be Z2 symmetric, and this one C2 symmetric anyway. So this means that with QAOA, you can only create Z2 symmetric states. And this is the restriction that we would like to uh, study. Okay, so let me begin with a simple example. So this is basically um, the icing model on a ring. And I will use the following conventions throughout this talk. So we'll, we'll consider families of Hamiltonians indexed by the number of qubits and um, these Hamiltonians are sums of local terms on some graph, and each of these local terms has constant norm and will normalize the energy in such a way that the ground state energy is zero. So this is going to be important because we would like to talk about low energy states. Okay, so what can we say about preparing ground states of this Hamiltonian? Um, and in particular, um, what is sort of the required non-locality of a circuit that does this? So let's look at 1D local circuits, which look something like this. And we can define the range of the circuit as basically uh, the distance um, by which a local operator can propagate under the action of the circuit or its inverse. So basically, we're talking about the sizes of the forward and backward light cones. So this is just one way of quantifying locality in a circuit. Of course, you could also use um, geometric notions in circuit depth. Okay, so, so what's the answer to this question? Well, it depends on whether this unitary is arbitrary or, the, or whether we impose that it is Z2 symmetric. So if the unitary can be arbitrary, then we can prepare basically any ground state here, and we can achieve this just by applying Hadamard to every qubit. So this is a, a strictly local circuit. Um, on the other hand, if we demand that U is Z2 symmetric, then you see that this resulting state is an eigenstate of the symmetry operator with eigenvalue one. So it has to be the GHZ state if it's in the ground space. And we know that preparing the GHZ state from a product state needs linear range. Okay, so you see a, a quite, quite a difference between Z2 symmetric circuits and um, standard or arbitrary circuits. So let me briefly explain this range lower bounds. So this can be found in this paper by Bravi, Hastings, and Bershrede. And it's really quite a simple, elegant argument. So suppose we have a circuit which prepares this GHZ state, then we can consider um, these two states, one of which is the GHZ state. These states have the property that they are orthogonal to each other. And if you trace out one of the qubits, then the reduced density operators are the same. So this means you cannot distinguish them locally. You need at least uh, 
n qubits to or you need to look at n qubits. Now, if you apply the inverse of the circuit, we obtain a product state in the first case, and then we obtain a state which is orthogonal to this product state. So this means that um, because you're orthogonal to a product state, um, there has to be a local observable on, on one of the qubits that distinguishes these two states. Okay, and now we can just go back and look at the operator that you obtain by conjugating. And you see that this operator has to distinguish these two states, but we know that they can only be distinguished if the, the support of this operator is large. And this gives you this range lower bound. Okay, so I, I told you that Z2 symmetric circuit need a linear range and we can ask whether, uh, whether this bound is tight. So here's a circuit which prepares the GHC state from, a, from this product state. And you see that each of these gates is in fact uh, Z2 symmetric. So the whole circuit is Z2 symmetric and the range is basically N over two. So, um, so this bound can be achieved. So, so far I've, told, I've talked about the ground state of this Ising model. And we saw that there's a big difference between symmetric and um, arbitrary circuits. And of course, this is something extremely well known to physicists under the name of symmetry protected um, phases. So if you impose symmetry, you basically can get a refined symmetry classification. And this is extremely successful. Okay, so let me now drop symmetry for a moment and um, talk about a different system where we talk about, where we think about um, sort of circuit depth. <clears throat> oh, sorry, sorry, before continuing, um, Sorry. Um, so, so, so this was about ground states. We can ask whether the same is true for low energy states, whether it's hard to create low energy states in terms of range. So we can actually show a range um, lower bound uh, for preparing states that have low energy density. So if you want to get an energy density below some epsilon, then the range has to scale as one over epsilon. And basically, we would like to get bounds of this type, but um, for other models and bounds that scale somehow with n. So this is going to be our goal. But now I would like to um, change the topic somewhat and, uh, and drop the symmetry condition. So um, let's look at the Tori code. So this is a model where you know that creating this from a product state requires a circuit depth, which is linear in the linear system size. So if you want to create a ground state, um, you, need, you need large depth. And this is a manifestation or a statement of the fact that um, these ground, state are, ground states are topologically ordered. A different way of expressing this would be to say that if you have a short depth circuit, then the output circuit, the output cannot be a ground state. So whenever the number of qubits is large compared to the circuit depth, um, you get an output which is not a ground state of the Tori code. So every zero energy state of this model has topological order. And the natural question is whether perhaps all low energy states also have this property. So by low energy states, I mean states that have an energy density below some constant. And this turns out to be not the case. So for any um, constant energy density, you can actually write down a circuit which has constant depth and which creates a state that has energy density below epsilon times the number of qubits. The way you do this is you just create um, small surface codes on small patches. And then the only energy contributions are from these boundaries. And, and this is low. Um, well, density. So the, the contribution um, can be made arbitrarily small in terms of energy density. Okay, so this motivates um, a problem. Um, so we can ask whether there are perhaps Hamiltonians for which um, not only the ground states, but all low energy states are, have topological order. And this is um, this was introduced by Friedman and Hastings and it's called the no low energy trivial states conjecture. So the conjecture is that there are Hamiltonians which have the, uh, the, this property here. So this property here says that as long as the 
system size is large enough compared to the circuit depth. Um, any circuit of that depth cannot create um, a state with energy density below some epsilon. Okay, so, so in other words, every low energy state is um, non-trivial in the sense of circuit depth for preparation. Okay, and the conjecture says there is such a family of local Hamiltonians. And so, so this conjecture is, um, of course, very interesting from the point of view of topological order, but it's also important, for example, um, because of the quantum PCP theorem. It's actually a necessary condition for the quantum PCP theorem to hold. So perhaps this is an easier target to, to, to try to um, achieve first. Uh, now, it turns out that many natural Hamiltonians they don't exhibit this NLTS property, as I just explained. Tori cold Hamiltonians don't have this property. We can create low energy states. Um, and other, um, there are various other families of Hamiltonians that have been shown not to exhibit this NLTS property. Um, there's also a, a, two, some positive results. So um, Harrow and Eldar and also Friedman and Hastings, they, they show um, sort of related properties. Um, so, so, so this, uh, this is a slightly different property, this no low energy trivial states property. And Friedman and Hastings, they restrict to certain subsets of states. So why am I explaining all this? Well, um, what we can do here is we can uh, create, uh, we, we can establish a uh, symmetry protected version of this uh, conjecture. Um, so basically we introduce something we call the no low energy Z2 trivial states property or NLZ2TS, if you like. And the only difference here is that we impose Z2 symmetry everywhere. So we, we ask that these Hamiltonians are Z2 symmetric and the unitaries are now restricted to be Z2 symmetric. Okay, so the statement is that um, you cannot create a low energy density state using a Z2 symmetric circuit of small depth. <clears throat> and our main result is basically an explicit family of Hamiltonians that have this uh, NLZ2TS property. Okay, so let me describe the construction. So we need expander graphs. Um, so basically infinite families of graphs um, where the Cheeger constant of the graphs is lower bounded by some constant independent of the number of vertices. So the Cheeger constant basically measures how many um, edges are touched by a subset of vertices. And we can get such infinite families um, because they are so-called Ramanujan graphs. So they are d regular graphs, which satisfy this lower bound on the Cheeger constant. And there are constructions for any regularity parameter larger than or equal to three. Okay, so let's take such a family of Ramanujan graphs and just consider this max cut Hamiltonian that uh, I basically introduced earlier. And so, so if you look at these Hamiltonians, it turns out that they satisfy this NLZ2 TS property. So whenever you have a circuit which has small circuit depths as expressed by this inequality, then the resulting state has an energy density lower bounded by this constant times n. Okay. So you cannot go below this energy density using a short depth circuit. Okay. So unless uh, your circuit depth is uh, growing, at least um, logarithmically, you cannot create a low energy state density state. Okay, so let me briefly explain the proof of this result. So suppose you, you can actually create such a low energy, energy density state. Then what you can do is you can consider the distribution that you get when you measure such a state in the computational basis. And because the Hamiltonian is diagonal, um, this distribution is basically concentrated on classical configurations that have low energy. So let me define um, the set of low energy classical configurations as those that have expectation value less than h over three times n. And then you know from this inequality here that basically this set of configurations has to have 
at least constant weight, at least weight a half under this output distribution of the circuit. Okay, so now we can ask what do these low energy configurations look like? And the point here is that these expectation values, they are exactly given by the cut size between um, the vertices labeled zero and the vertices labeled one. So this is exactly because we defined this Hamiltonian in this way. So when, when this number is small, um, it tells us something about these cut sizes. But for expander graphs, this cut size is uh, lower bounded by the Cheeger constant times the minimum size of these two sets. Okay, so now, so for these low energy co um, configurations, we have an upper bound on this quantity. So we get an upper bound on basically the number of zeros in this classical configuration and the number of ones in this classical configuration. So in other words, every low energy configuration either has a, a small number of ones or a large number of ones. Uh, by small and large, I mean um, less than n over 3 or more than 2n over 3. So this denotes the Hamming weight. Okay, so going back, I told you that this um, set has large probability mass under the distribution produced by the circuit. So we know that the union of these sets has probability mass at least a half. And now we can use the fact that our circuit is actually Z2 symmetric. So this means that the output distribution is invariant under flipping all the bits, which means that these low weight strings, low Hamming weight strings and high weight Hamming weight strings, they have to have the same probability mass. So each of these sets has to have at least a quarter probability mass. So now what this is saying is that we have a depth D circuit, which produces a distribution that is supported has large support or large weight, both on low weight strings and high weight strings. So these two sets have high Hamming distance or linear Hamming distance. Um, and this turns out to be impossible unless the circuit depth um, is large or grows at least logarithmically with n by a beautiful result by Eldar and Harrell. So this result is actually um, takes this form. So that this is um, corollary 43 in their paper. Um, basically, what it says is that if you have a circuit which produces some distribution, and um, let's say we have a lower bound on um, the probability weight of two subsets that have some Hamming distance. So in our case, this Hamming distance is linear. Um, then we have a relationship between the depth of the circuit and this distance. In particular, if this distance is large, then it means that the um, depth also has to be large. Okay, and this is basically the origin of, um, well, of this result. And now um, I would like to go back to QAOA and see what this implies. So um, of course, if you let the level grow arbitrarily, then you can reach any approximation ratio because this approximates um, adiabatic computation. But as I said, we we're interested in small p or constant p. So for example, for p equals one um, there were, and d regular graphs, there was this, um, well, this explicit formula for the approximation, approximation ratio uh, achieved by QAOA. Um, but as Sergey already mentioned, um, Hastings found um, that numerically optimized classical algorithms are actually better in terms of approximation ratio for, um, for, for graphs with regularity parameter up to a thousand. So with, with just a few exceptions, these um, classical algorithms are actually better than level one QAOA. Now in the very first paper um, about QAOA, um, there was also a, um, a computation of the approximation ratio for level two QAOA uh, for certain graphs. And um, well, also this number is of course um, not quite as high as um, this Gimmons Williamson result. But what we really care about now is um, whether we can perhaps increase P and um, 
and, and get something better. So, so what about um, constants p um, that is larger than one or two, perhaps? Um, can we say something here? Well, this NLZ2TS property can be immediately translated uh, to, this, to this problem. And we can get an upper bound on the QAA approximation ratio for d regular graphs. So we, we choose in particular families of uh, d regular bipartite graphs. So as long as the level, the QAA level, is less than logarithmic, you cannot beat this number, this approximation ratio. In particular, if you choose this d large enough, then this set becomes smaller than this Gummins. Williamson approximation ratio. So, so in other words, um, for any constant p, which certainly satisfies this, um, you, you cannot beat um, Gemmins Williamson using QAOA. QA <clears throat> for, for this particular um, set of graphs. Okay. So the proof of this is um, actually really an immediate consequence of what I said before. Um, one thing I would like to point out here is that we use bipartite graphs because then we know what this maximum is. So this makes, makes it easy to compute approximation ratios. And then we also use bipartiteness to, um, to, to do a certain symmetry argument, which basically uh, allows you to change the sign in some sense. Okay, and then, then you can really relate this to, uh, to this NLZ2TS, which can be stated in this form. And the only ingredient you need at this point is that if you have a QAOA circuit, um, then it's C2 symmetric, of course, and um, the, well, the depth is bounded by the level times the regularity of the graph. Okay. So, um, so, so this is basically um, our main results. So we cannot um, beat Gemmins Williamson for constant level P. So now, um, just to conclude, um, so, so we have this NLTS property, and of course, the general property is still open. We have this upper bound on um, what QIOA can do. And um, I should say that this is, of course, um, a worst case bound. So this relates to the, the question that Bedran had earlier. Um, so we don't really know whether there are perhaps families uh, where this quantum algorithm does perform well. And I think it's interesting to um, ask a question whether perhaps we can say more about generic instances. And there was this recent paper by Edfari, uh, Gabarnik, and Gutman that um, was mentioned earlier. Um, where they actually consider uh, random graphs and the problem of finding large independent sets. And they, they find some upper bound, which has the same form. So it also um, says that this, this level has to grow logarithmically if you want to beat a certain threshold. Okay, I think this is an interesting direction to, to consider sort of um, generic instances and hardness for that. And finally, um, as we saw in Sergey's talk, we can also ask, about ways of getting around this no-go theorem and um, using, for example, this variable elimination idea. So, so basically, this um, makes the algorithm non-local, and, and, and therefore, these bounds do not apply. OK, so with this, I would like to thank you and uh, my collaborators. Um, so I guess that's it. Okay, thank you, Robert, for a very nice talk. Um, I, maybe I can quickly uh, ask a question before other people uh, say something. So to what extent, so you're relying very much on the symmetry, right? And you could say how robust are these results to deviations thereof? For example, the, in practice, the QAOA is not perfectly symmetric, perhaps. But then do you still, can you still prove something? Or is it really, you know, is it not very robust against that? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I mean, you're big... assuming that U has this symmetry, the Z2 symmetry, right? I mean, yeah, I understand the question, but I think maybe it's a bit difficult to define what approximate symmetry means, but um, yeah, 
yeah, maybe, maybe um, right. I understand. Uh, it's uh, maybe heavily re rely on this, and um, I mean, um, yeah, I mean that that's of course a restriction. But on the other hand, it's it's slightly. I mean, it applies to things that are more general than QAOA, for example. But do you think this result still holds? If you, I mean, it, what's your intuition? If there's still some some that, that well, this I mean, doesn't perform so well, if you would you know modify this, you don't fully impose the symmetry, but it's slightly or. Yeah, we haven't thought too much about this. I mean, certainly, if you drop the symmetry altogether, then the sizing model doesn't satisfy this property anymore. So, um, may I say something? You know, if you look at the, our paper, our recent paper, we look at independent set, and independent set does not have the uh, Z2 symmetry. Um, um, so, you know, we're able to get similar results, but the, the way we get it is by looking at the light cone and showing that if you have uh, qubits, which are far apart on a graph, that the measurement outcomes are uncorrelated, uh, and we don't do it using any symmetry property. So yeah, you can, Barbara, do other things. Okay, I see, yeah. There may be more general arguments that this Yeah, means. I mean, it's the same spirit, but you know, it depends. Yeah, you don't need the C2, for, independent set doesn't have the C2 symmetry. Okay, so um, we can have some other questions. Um, I, I have a couple of small questions. Uh, first, a kind of, uh, well, more physics oriented question. This property NLTS, is it expected to mean something for the you know high robustness of topological order or something like that? Um, so I guess you, you mean something like um, non-zero temperature perhaps? Or... Yes, exactly, right. Um, um, I, I suppose so, I think, I think there were, yeah. There is a paper by Eldar about um, sort of um, thermal states, deep states, and um, NLTS-like questions. But I, I'm not sure how directly um, this relates to low-lying excitations. And, um, OK. I have one other small question about the heuristics of this uh, GW. You know, there's this threshold or this uh, guaranteed number 0.878 that you're always above. But is there some expectation that for most graphs it's far above that or much closer to one? Um, I'm I'm not familiar with this. I mean, the, it's a worst case bound. So, um, mm -hmm. I mean, but there's no I, nothing that you know about concerning like typical case. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. Okay. Um. Other One questions, moment. Robert. Uh, yes. Like you, you said, like you have these open questions about other symmetries. Do you have any comments on that? Oh, about uh, other symmetries. Yes. So, um, so, so, so one question would be, for example, Z three symmetry, which we will need for this coloring problems that, that Sergey mentioned. So, um, so there. I mean, this is still um, open or work in progress, I guess. Um, is but that what you mean? The right? Other symmetry groups, or? But the, but do you think that the techniques that you that you use could be extended to these other symmetries, or or you think that there there's some barrier there? I think the difficulty is finding sort of the right kind of examples. I mean, um, so I, I assume some related ideas should apply, but um, it's it's not immediate or at least it doesn't seem to be immediate from, from our results. Um, uh, I think it would be nice to have some general approach that, that gives you this kind of bounds more generally for, for different kinds of problems at the same time. Um, but... Okay, thanks. Um, more questions? I have see one question uh, from the audience, Karen Mons asks, so to confirm, the best classical polytime algorithm beats QAOA for any constant level P only on D regular bipartite graphs, right? Not in general. Well, in fact, it's uh, it's more specific than that. I mean, it's, it's a certain family of D regular bipartite graphs, namely those that have 
that are expander graphs. I mean, you, you need this um, expansion bound. Right. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Maybe a last one? Maybe not. Okay, anyhow, um, let's thank Robert again. And um, we're closing this session. Okay, see you all tomorrow. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.